Welcome everyone to The Real News Network. My name is Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief here at The Real News. And it's so great to have you all with us. As we record this in late July 2022, the planet is boiling. The global heat map is an unsettling array of oranges and reds. In the past six months alone, deadly, record-breaking heat waves have pummeled India and Pakistan, the Middle East and large swaths of China, Africa, the Mediterranean, Latin America and the Caribbean, Europe, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Extreme weather conditions are causing regular droughts, crop failures, wildfires, floods, mass wildlife deaths, and more and more people living in parts of the world that are being hit the hardest are being forced to leave their homes in the hopes of finding more livable climates. Climate catastrophe is not coming. It's here. And from the fossil fuel industry to the military industrial complex, from the halls of Washington, D.C. to Wall Street, a death cult of corporate and governmental power brokers continue to squeeze our dying world for as much profit and control of resources as they can while blocking meaningful climate action and condemning current and future generations to a normalized but totally avoidable dystopia. As Brad Plumer and Henry Fountain wrote one year ago for the New York Times, quote, Nations have delayed curbing their fossil fuel emissions for so long that they can no longer stop global warming from intensifying over the next 30 years, though there is still a short window to prevent the most harrowing future, a major new United Nations scientific report has concluded. Humans have already heated the planet by roughly 1.1 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Fahrenheit since the 19th century, largely by burning coal, oil, and gas for energy. And the consequences can be felt across the globe. But that's only the beginning, according to the report issued by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a body of scientists convened by the United Nations. Even if nations started sharply cutting emissions today, total global warming is likely to rise around 1.5 degrees Celsius within the next two decades, a hotter future that is now essentially locked in, end quote. As much as it destroys me to say this, it is too late for us to completely avert the catastrophic effects of climate change. But it is not too late to do everything that we can to mitigate these effects, to minimize further warming, and to fight like hell for a future that's still worth living in. To do so requires first soberly acknowledging where we are as a species on this planet. And here at The Real News, we are hoping to do just that by bringing you a range of regular interviews with climate scientists, climate activists, and people from different parts of the world who are already feeling and fighting the effects of climate change. To kick off that effort, I had the immense honor of chatting with NASA climate scientist Nathan Kurtz right after he returned to the U.S. from his latest research trip to the Arctic. Nathan Kurtz received his B.S. degree in physics from Iowa State University in 2004 and his M.S. and Ph.D. degrees in atmospheric physics from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in 2007 and 2009, respectively. He worked on sea ice thickness retrievals from the original ICESAT mission during his graduate school studies and has since focused his work on improving model parameterizations and satellite-based retrievals of sea ice properties from NASA's Operation Ice Bridge mission, as well as ESA's Cryosat-2 radar satellite. Put in simple terms, Nathan and his team study the thickness of sea ice in the Arctic, which is what I wanted to talk to him about in our sit-down chat, which we recorded here at The Real News Studio. We talk about the alarming rate at which sea ice in the Arctic and land ice on the Greenland ice sheet are melting and what that means for our global ecosystem 
and for life on this planet. My name's Nathan Kurtz. I'm the chief of NASA's Cryospheric Sciences Laboratory at Goddard Space Flight Center. Also the deputy project scientist for NASA's ISAT-2 satellite. It's uh, called the Ice, Cloud, and Land Elevation Satellite. It's the second one. Well, Nathan, thank you so much for coming down and chatting with us today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and you know, I know that your work is more pressing now <laughs> than ever before. <laughs> like, you know, we are talking, we are having this conversation amidst a you know record-breaking heat wave that's got like most of the global map bright red, um, and you know, your work as I understand it, you know, you've done a lot of, uh, in, you know, trips up to uh, the Arctic, you, you've looked at the um, Greenland ice sheet, and you actually just got back from an expedition. Is that right? Yeah, just came back from Greenland on uh, three days ago. So Welcome adjusting, <laughs> adjusting to the heat back here. Sweet. So like, you know, we wanted to take the opportunity to, to sit down and chat with you about your work, uh, about um, what you're seeing on these expeditions, because, um, you know, I think right now all of our collective climate anxieties are through the roof. And I guess I just wanted to give a heads up to listeners and viewers that like that's probably not going to go away by the end of this, <laughs> but it's important for us to sit down and stare clear-eyed like at the situation before us to learn from you know your expertise and your research to know how bad things are um and you know what we can do to avert total climate catastrophe right so that's what we're going to kind of talk about today but before we get there you know this is a very special kind of occasion uh because i've gotten the honor to interview your dad jeff kurtz Retired railroad engineer, um, you know, union officer, Iowa State um, representative. And, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the situation going on in the U.S. rail industry and all the shenanigans there. As we speak, uh, we are closer to a national rail shutdown than we've been uh, in most of my lifetime. So I just wanted to, like, take the quick opportunity, since Real News viewers have gotten to see me chat with your dad, how uh, you, as the son of a railroader, uh, ended up getting into NASA and glaciology? Like, what was, where did you diverge? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, growing up, I heard my dad always talking about working on the railroad. I obviously saw how difficult it was, the odd hours that he had to work, and, you know, just very hard, like, mm -hmm. job to do. And, you know, he always told me, get an education, go out and, and do things. And I was always interested in science. Uh, he wanted to push me towards engineering, but I was stubborn, just like he's stubborn. And <laughs> <laughs> Runs in the family, yeah, does it? <laughs> does, does. Said, no, I, I want to do science. And so, yeah, he, he was kind of open to it. We uh, remember we went up to Iowa State University where I got my undergraduate degree. We visited the physics department and he sort of came around to it. Yeah, I guess physics could be interesting. And mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, I had different things that I wanted to do back then. But yeah, I was learning physics. It was exciting, really interesting. Um, I ended up getting a, an internship at NASA at Goddard Space Flight Center uh, just down the road from here uh, in 2003, so almost 20 years ago. And that's what kind of kicked me off towards, OK, I can make a career out of science. Um, you know, my, my dad and my parents were all really proud. Going to NASA was a big thing. Jumping from Iowa to, to NASA was... Yeah, that's a big jump. Big, yeah, big deal. <laughs> that's pretty sweet. <laughs> um, and I guess, like, um, how... Can you say a bit more about how you got um, invested in glaciology? Sure. Uh, so it was a winding path. The My summer internship was actually trying to study ice on moons of Jupiter. It was, can we detect an ocean underneath these moons of Jupiter and, you know, look for signs of life, things like that. Really interesting. Uh, I then came to graduate school, uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, Shout out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, was in the, the physics department there. Um, but the funding that I was, uh, for the project that I was going to work on, uh, Congress had, had cut the funding. It was a satellite that was going to go to Jupiter, 
Um, and yeah, they, they cut the funding. Um, but there are Earth observation satellites that are also studying ice, but on Earth. And uh, physics is physics, like whether it's Moon or Jupiter or Earth, like the same kind of physics applies. And so I was doing remote sensing, and it was just a, a natural fit to then start studying ice on the Earth. And that's when I really became interested in, oh, you know, this has real relevance to what we're, you know, what we're seeing on the, the Earth. Like, wow, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Changes in, that we're seeing in the ice, and I can study this. I can make a difference here. So it was a natural progression. Okay, I'm going to start studying ice uh, on the Earth. Okay, so I know... Keep in mind, you're speaking to, uh, you know, someone with literature degrees. So talk to me as if you were talking to a child <laughs> who doesn't know shit about physics. Um, but yeah, we don't have, we don't have to be that rudimentary. But I know that um, the research that you do, um, you know, is very complex. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll try to kind of walk uh, viewers through it a bit. But I guess before we kind of zero in on your more recent um, expeditions, I was wondering if you could kind of say a bit more about the kind of things that you're tracking. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess just like how, how would you explain the research that you do to novices like myself? Sure. Um, so I guess just by way of background, um, you know, before I was in school, people were tracking changes in the ice with different kind of remote sensing tools. So whether it's microwave, radar, laser, things like that. Uh, so I, there's a long history of, of that. And a lot of what built off from what I was able to build on, people used satellites that were launched in the, the late 70s to start tracking like a reliable climate record, mm -hmm. uh, especially of the, the ice that's in the Arctic Ocean and the, the Southern Ocean. And really, uh, it was in the 80s they saw that Wow, you know this. There's looks like there's big changes, especially in the Arctic. Uh, in the Arctic, the Antarctic, it's like there were more rudimentary climate models, and they were saying, "Well, we should see changes in the Antarctic, but this is a really complex system. We don't necessarily have a good handle on what's going on." Uh, flash forward to me being in graduate school, uh, a new satellite was launched that NASA launched. It used a laser in space to track very, very uh, small changes of uh, in the surface height. So then we were able to see to a, a you know, really high accuracy, okay, what's, what's changing in the ice? And especially the ice in the ocean, we measure how high the ice is above the water level. Uh, and from that, we can determine how thick the ice is. Mm -hmm. And so this was a very new thing um, to be able to do. And again, as technology is progressing, we're able to do this better and better. And so, uh, yeah, in graduate school, I was able to see uh, there were big changes happening in the Arctic, especially then. Uh, and I could see that in the data, you know, looking at this actual data, uh, process it myself and be like, wow, look at how much the ice was, was thinning uh, at this time. And so I've just been using all kinds of remote sensing tools, uh, focusing on radar and laser, trying to determine that you know how how is the size changing and can we track it over decades to get this reliable climate record and before we had satellites with lasers beaming down to track like to the to the centimeter basically like how much the ice was melting or thinning or poking up above the water is this the kind of thing that we would measure by like basically putting a stick in the ground and seeing how far <laughs> the, the ice like went up or down yeah uh that other a lot of people went out um yeah drill you mm -hmm. drill through the ice uh or what was used long ago were submarines so submarines had upward looking sonar uh and they were able to track the the thickness of the ice but the the problem was all that data was classified for for years wow. uh because you know you if the ice is very thick a submarine can't surface through it, it mm -hmm. needs to be thin enough. And so, yeah, that, that data was classified, uh, but scientists were able to work to get it unclassified or to the degree that they needed to, to really start tracking uh, changes in the, the thickness of the ice. And now, uh, but again, like a submarine takes a more limited profile. It's wherever the submarine happened to go. Now with satellites, we can start 
getting you know a, a look essentially at the whole of the Arctic or the Antarctic over the the course of a month for the laser and radar satellites that I use with microwave. This it's called passive microwave. Uh, you get daily coverage. So uh, yeah, all kinds of tools available, um, but used to be more rudimentary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what we have. And um, and you specialize in the like. So I guess another thing to clarify for folks, right, is that there are different kinds of ice, right? And yes. you um, specialize in the ice that is in the ocean, right? Yes. So I have, yeah, specialized with the what's called the sea ice, um, and so sea ice doesn't affect things like uh, sea level rise, sea level change, because it's already floating. Mm -hmm. But what it does affect is the energy balance of the Earth, and so. Uh, especially as the Arctic, the sea ice has been decreasing substantially. You're seeing the Arctic is warming about four times as much as the, the planet as a whole. And it's because you're losing that sea ice. It's exposing this very dark ocean, which absorbs a lot of the sun's energy, and it, it warms the Arctic. Uh, whereas the ice that's on the land, so like on Greenland or Antarctica, that's the, the ice sheets. And so that doesn't have so much of an impact on climate as it's melting, but what that does when that ice melts, it raises sea level. And so we're seeing sea level is raising a very big societal issue now. And you know, people want to know what's going to happen uh, in the next hundred years with sea level rise. There's a lot of uncertainty in that. And so we're trying to track it and get better understanding of that too. Well, thank God that you are because, um, yeah, man, I mean like this, this shit keeps me awake at night. Right. And I guess like, you know, I just want to be like upfront uh, about that. Right? Like I said, like I'm, I, my climate anxiety is through the roof, especially after this week with um, uh, heat records being broken across Europe. Um, but, you know, before that, even we there were devastating um, kind of heat waves in India and, you know, all across the, the southern hemisphere, it seemed like. And um you know, I know uh, not to conflate like, you know, all the kind of sort of weather conditions that we're experiencing, but right, just I, I, I'm very, very grateful to you and the folks who are studying this stuff, because I think a lot of us have that natural tendency to want to put it out of sight, out of mind. Um, it's almost too big and menacing and horrifying to confront all at once. Um, but it's important that we not push us under the rug, that we actually understand the situation that we're in and how bad things actually are uh, before it is truly too late. So in that vein, I wanted to ask, like, I mean, because you've, you've taken a number of expeditions up to the Arctic, up to Greenland. Um, I wanted to ask, like, kind of before we focus on your most recent trip, what over that time span of your 10 plus expeditions like what changes have you seen in the sea ice that you study or the ice sheet when you're flying above it you know for hours on end mm -hmm. uh so you know that's there's a real dichotomy there so with the ice sheet the ice that's on the land like that's where you can visibly see changes because you see uh like the calving front of a glacier like you know, one year it was way out towards the ocean, and then a few years later, how it's really came back. And I mean, that's like a real and stark visible change. And especially there's places in Antarctica that I've been that, you know, there's been pretty profound changes in in, in where the calving front of these these glaciers has been. I uh, and calving is when like big chunks of yeah. glacier break off and fall into yes. the ocean. And I remember a few years ago in, in Antarctica as well, uh, I think it was the largest recorded iceberg, uh, I think as, as far as I know, it had calved off of, uh, I think it was uh, one of the Larsen ice shelves. And we flew over it. We were the first ones to really set eyes, like human eyes on this just massive, massive iceberg. And I remember looking at it and I mean, it, it looked like land, like it was so big. We were in a plane flying high up in the air and just, amazing that this thing had calved off and was you know is this the one that was like as big as manhattan uh much bigger much than bi that. oh yeah. that's right yeah, yeah that's right even bigger one uh so you know seeing things like that is uh alarming you know because you can visually see it and 
Whereas the, the changes that are happening with the, the sea ice, you can't see it with your eyes. That's why we need these sophisticated tools to be like, uh, especially when we're tracking, we want to track how thick the ice is. You can't really see that with your eyes. You can fly over a, a patch of ice that you'd be like, well, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, this would have been covered with ice. Uh, but again, to really get that kind of gut level mm -hmm. feeling of, wow, I, I see the ice changing. Um, yeah, you, you need the sophisticated scientific tools to do that. And those tools are telling you about the sea ice specifically, what? Uh, so what we've seen is that it's, it's thinning. Um, and so it's about half as thick as it was in the mid to early 80s uh, in the Arctic. And so as this ice is thinning, it's now retreating more and more in the summer. So uh, every year around September, the Arctic sea ice reaches what's called its minimum. So it, it melts throughout the summer and then it reaches the lowest point and then it, then it rebounds back and it starts to grow. Uh, it used to be that pretty much most of the Arctic Ocean was, was covered with sea ice year round. Uh, now, uh, we're facing in maybe 20 or 30 years where there might be no ice or almost no ice left in the Arctic Ocean. At the end. So we're seeing, you know, really profound changes, especially in the, the Arctic sea ice. Jesus. Um, and like, and, and just to kind of tease out what you said before for viewers and listeners, um, who are trying to wrap their heads around that, like, I think you made it. Uh, a really important point, right? That um, when in, it's the, you know, uh, land ice that's melting, right? That doesn't have as much to do with kind of the changing climate dynamics, but it does raise sea levels. Whereas the sea ice that you're studying, like as it melts, the dark, the dark like Arctic Ocean absorbs more of that heat from the sun thereby kind of having more of a climatic effect. Yeah, so that that energy that gets absorbed, yeah, we that's why we've seen the Arctic is about warming about four times the rate as the rest of the globe. And so that changes the atmospheric circulation of the whole planet. Because the, the planet is, you know, set up for, you have a warm equator, you have a cold pole, and you, you get this these circulation patterns, these very large scale circulation patterns that, that get set up. And there's a lot of research now that's going into, okay, it looks like because we've changed the temperature uh, of the Arctic so much that you know we're seeing different circulation patterns. And people are trying to understand you know, more specifically, does this lead to like, you know, more snowfall events or different uh, precipitation patterns in the US? And so the, I mean, this is the really new research that's being done. And it's like, it looks like there is some impact to, you know, us here in the US or in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard statistically to, to say, yes, this is, we know what, you know, really, really good confidence that this is happening. Uh, we just need more data, more time. But, you know, a lot of research is pointing to the fact that, yes, it is changing weather for us here. Yeah. And, um, so I guess we'll, we'll kind of circle back to that to, to finish off, right? Like to really put all this in context um, for, for folks um, you know, about how this connects to the larger struggle to mitigate, you know, the effects of climate chaos, um, how much we can still do that um, where, given where we are right now. But, you know, as you mentioned, you just got back from an expedition um, so I wanted to ask about that for, for a second. Um, first, just to give people like a kind of eye, like eye level view. So when I think of this, and I, when I ask a very dumb question, but it's like, I think of like the thing, right? That movie from the eighties, <laughs> the thing. like, I think of, I think of you like, you know, Arctic researchers like yourself, just like stuck in an outpost somewhere, <laughs> um, you know, going a bit stir crazy, surrounded by ice, um, you know, not not to you know, belittle the work that you do, but I'm just like, I, clearly I, I have no frame of reference here. So I was wondering if you could just say a bit about like, what does an expedition like that entail? Like, what do you, what do you, what, what is your day to day like when you go on these expeditions? Uh, so a lot of the expeditions I've been are for airborne work. So we're trying to fly an airplane either 
underneath the satellite or to try to help better understand our satellite data. Uh, and so those, uh, a lot of times we'll go to remote airfields uh, in Alaska or in this case in Greenland, uh, I was at Thule Air Force Base, so uh, base in US military has in, in Northern Greenland. And so it is, it's very remote. Internet's not very good, mm -hmm. uh, which, but you know, day to day, it's uh, it's a lot of looking at the weather. Um, can we fly? Are we able to <laughs> fly where we're able to fly under the satellite track? Is it going to be clear? Is it going to be cloudy? Is it, you know, worth trying to take that risk to, to fly? Um, looking at the satellite tracks, the timing of it, uh, and then looking at things like the wind out in the Arctic Ocean, because it's going to be pushing the ice, making it drift. So, you know, trying to get a handle on all kinds of issues like with, with timing, with weather, with safety. We deal with the pilots and the weather office. It's got to be safe enough for us to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's, you know, that they're, they're really good about, you know, having tolerances and limits on, on what is safe and what's not. But, you know, bottom line, it's it still can be dangerous. Like just this morning we were, uh, I was trying to help direct our our crew that's, in Greenland right now, and it was too foggy. They they couldn't take off, and you know if they did, it would have been dangerous. Or we talked about last week uh, issues where, uh, you know, if if they had taken off, maybe they couldn't have landed again wow. <laughs> in the same airfield. There there are diverts and such, but you know it's making sure that everyone's safe, making sure that we can collect the data that we want. And you have like you have like a small window every year to actually collect that data, right? Yeah, yeah. In this case, we were there for about two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, the, the satellite's always collecting data, but you know, the reason we went there this time was our data that we collect in the summer, it's just, there's a lot less known about mm -hmm. how the, the laser interacts with the surface when it starts to melt. And so that's, that's why we wanted to come in this short window when things are melting uh, and then conduct the research that way. Okay, so then on this, like, I guess, like, let's talk about this latest expedition, maybe in comparison to your first. Mm -hmm. um, what did you see? Uh, I mean, in, in my very first expedition to the Arctic, it was in spring, it was in probably March, uh, it would have been a little more than 10 years ago. And so everything's frozen over, man. It's... We have regular day-night cycles. Um, the ice is clearly thick. It's I can see big ridges and, and such. And um, again, because it's at kind of it's the peak of how thick that it gets. Whereas this time it's in the the summer. It's near uh, <laughs> after things have melted quite a bit. So there's all kinds of uh, melt ponds, is what they're called, covering the surface. Uh, the ice is a lot more broken up. Um, so yeah, big changes that, that just happen seasonally, but you know, even thinking of how the ice was 10 years ago when I first went compared to now, it's, it has changed. Like we have lost ice since that time. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, I guess like by way of rounding out, let's kind of like put that in the context of the bigger picture, right? Because yeah, you know, it's something that we've been wanting to cover more you know at the real news like we do the best we can with the people that we've got but like you know a lot of what we do is we cover grassroots struggles right mm -hmm. whether those be workers fighting for better wages and respect on the job and safer working conditions so on and so forth whether those be you know people fighting against the violence of the prison industrial complex or the police industrial complex and you know, what I've noticed of late, especially, is that, like, increasingly more scientists are, like, kind of at their wits end and taking even, like, direct action to try to raise the alarm about the climate emergency. And, you know, uh, Joe, President Joe Biden is gesturing towards, you know, like, doing something to acknowledge the climate emergency. But, like, you know, we've it feels like the headline is just like, we need drastic societal change to avert the catastrophe that we are careening towards and in many ways are already in. So I guess I just wanted to like, since I've got you here, 
big shot NASA <laughs> glaciologist. <laughs> like, I, wa- I wanted to ask you just kind of bluntly, like, how bad is it? What does your research tell us about the state that humanity and the planet are in? And I guess, like, what sort of message would you really want to communicate to viewers and listeners uh, about the situation that we're in right now regarding the climate? Sure. I mean, you know, one of the, the biggest things that we as scientists do is we we gather the facts and we're just trying to present the facts. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when we talk about how, how much the ice is thinning or how much uh, ice is, is melting from Greenland or Antarctica, you know, trying to put that in terms of numbers. Uh, because that's what, you know, we, we want people to ultimately take these numbers and then, then, you know, have the information that they need to make whatever decisions that, that they need to be based on that. And so, uh, you know, we, we want people to believe what it is that we're saying too. And we have these very sophisticated tools, uh, to, to do this and measure it. And we have, you know, people working very hard, like, very intelligent people trying to to figure this out. So it's not that we're we're just making things up and uh, you know trying to push an agenda. We're we're just trying to report the facts. And again, people can hopefully make the decisions that that they need to based on that. And then a lot of the decisions have been geared towards you know let's try to hold warming uh, at a certain level because we expect you know with a certain level of warming we're we're already baked in. To a certain level of warming, and so we know that that will cause certain changes. But the thinking is that you know if we start getting to a higher level of warming, we, we could start seeing bigger and bigger changes, and especially uh, you know like big events happening that we wouldn't necessarily be prepared for societally to to deal with. And so we as scientists want to communicate, this is what we understand. There's also a lot of uncertainty in what we don't understand. Um, And, you know, best we can do is try to communicate that to people. Hope that they listen. Um, But but it's on, you know, us collectively to take action as, as we need to. And I guess in that regard, like the kind of headline as we've sort of been discussing here is that the sea ice is thinning at um alarming rates the ice sheet is melting at alarming rates though both of those have kind of uh, multiple effects um some that maybe we can see others that we can't but i mean even i'm just thinking of like you know messing up the jet stream right and and like all the kind of ripple effects that that has on wildlife on um, you know, the fishing industry and so on and so forth. So I think, is that, is that what you're talking about? Like the yeah. kind of like the ripple effects of increasing warming that we can't quite predict? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, things like sea level rise, there's a pretty big uncertainty. You know, the, the big aspect is what sea level rise is going to be like in 2100? You know, kind of the current generation of children or their children. What are they going to have to prepare for? What are cities going to have to... <laughs> deal with you know is it a a meter of sea level rise is it more um you know we we have to be prepared to to deal with that and so that's you know sea level rise that's just one aspect and like you said with uh with our weather patterns um you know changing the jet stream uh with changes in sea ice look like they might cause changes in how wavy the jet stream is and that's what sets up our you know weather patterns that we we come to rely on like here in the u.s where we want expect a certain amount of rainfall to grow certain crops or we expect uh temperature to be in a certain range to grow certain crops and so it's like if we can understand how we're, we're changing things you know maybe we can adapt or at least we say you know this is the the change that we can expect but there's there is a lot of uncertainty especially when you're talking about uh weather patterns in the, the US or Europe uh, that, that might come about. And so it's, it's difficult to, I, I guess, you know, talk about and be like, this is uncertain. Um, and, you know, people don't necessarily like to hear about uncertainties in science. They want it kind of absolutes and we, we, we don't deal with that. Yeah. Well, it's like, and it's the way that we understand that uncertainty, right? Because I think, again, just given the <clears throat> inaction, right, or, or the less than suitable action 
taken by the world's governments, um, taken by, you know, the planet destroying fossil fuel industry and so on and so forth, right? I think that when people like hear that the effects of climate change are uncertain, the immediate hope is like, well, maybe it'll just be closer to what we're used to, right? But like, like what we're kind of saying is like, well, no, we don't we don't know how bad it's going to get. We don't know how it's going to change weather patterns. We don't know how it's going to affect the supply chain, the food chain or stuff like that. What we do know is it's happening. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there are a lot of ways in which pretending that it's not happening is preventing us from being prepared for whatever effects may come. Mm -hmm. Well, Nathan, again, my climate anxiety is still here. <laughs> But I really, really appreciate you coming down and sharing uh, your work with us. And thank you for doing it. Thank you to your team for doing it. Uh, we'll keep doing what we can on this end to make sure that people know about it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. For everyone watching, this is Maximilian Alvarez for The Real News Network. Before you go, please head on over to therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly sustainer of our work so we can keep bringing you important coverage and conversations just like this. Thank you so much for watching.